Hey everyone, real quick, I want to talk about Chilling, the awesome horror app that I'm partnered with. In case you haven't heard, every week I have new stories released over on Chilling. There are now over 1,000 stories on Chilling, with a bunch of other YouTube narrators and professionals to choose from. On Chilling, you can do things that you'll never be able to do on YouTube. Choose from over 1,000 individual stories that are sorted into curated playlists or you can create your own. On Chilling, we give you so much flexibility to listen the way that you want. This includes a chilling, game-changing feature, our ambient menu. You can change the background sounds of the story at any time to fit your mood. Go from rain to a campfire with the press of a button. It's totally revolutionary. You need to try it. There have been a number of awesome updates to Chilling, such as the ability to download stories for offline listening, and the new social feature. You can now discuss your favorite stories with other users and friends. And we're just getting started. Not only are we adding hours of new content every week, but original video content is also in the works. Chilling is evolving into a must-have for all horror lovers. Please, go start your free trial over on Chilling and check out my personal playlist there. And also, Chilling is doing a new giveaway for August. They'll be giving away a new Xbox. To enter, all you have to do is leave a review and submit the entry form which will be linked down below in the description. Thanks again to Chilling for allowing me to be a part of this and I hope you all enjoy checking it out. Christmas of 2007 was an event that has always stood out in my mind, and now it always will. I was 13 at the time and that was the first and only year that dad had missed Christmas. He worked as a long haul truck driver and we were used to him being gone for weeks or even occasional months at a time. He always made it a point to be home for our birthdays and Christmas however, but that year it was different. Mom was worried when he said that he had one final load to deliver before the holiday season. His plan was to make his delivery and then be home on the 23rd just in time for Christmas. But Mother Nature had other ideas. As fate would have it, his route from our home in Minneapolis to Billings, Montana would take him right into the heart of a looming blizzard along I-94. The snow was falling in bunches at the time and Dad said that he was debating whether or not to pull over for the night in hopes that it would clear up. He decided to try and just keep going when the road made the decision for him. He was only about an hour away from Billings when his truck struck an unexpected patch of ice, causing him to lose control then slide off the road into the median. Thankfully, he wasn't injured, but his truck was wedged in nearly two feet of packed snow. It was around midnight when this had happened. He tried everything that he could think of to get the truck out of the snowdrift, but it was no use. Of course, his phone signal was non-existent as well, so he couldn't even call for assistance. The roads were virtually devoid of any travelers by that point as well. He radioed in to a local emergency office, but was told the roads were too hazardous to travel at the moment. In the end, he could do nothing but wait. Meanwhile, Christmas came and went for us and we didn't hear anything from Dad. Mom was a nervous wreck although she tried to hide it, while me and my two sisters were just sad that he wasn't there with us. Thankfully, Dad finally called late on Christmas evening. He apologized profusely for not being with us and promised that he would get home as soon as possible. We did just that two days later and we were relieved to have him back. He returned with a bundle of late Christmas gifts and all was well once more. But Dad was different though. He was quiet and appeared as though his mind was focused elsewhere. I didn't question him on it, but I could tell that something was troubling him. Life went on and Dad never missed another Christmas after that. He in fact just began taking the entire month of December off to prevent anything like that ever happening again. I didn't know this at the time, but later he told me that he never drove down I-94 again. He outright refused deliveries that took him along that stretch. And he would take detours that added multiple hours to his trip if it meant avoiding that spot. 
Us kids are all grown up now with kids of our own. My son just turned two and our whole family was once again together over this previous Christmas. We sat around watching his mom and dad lovingly spoiled their grandchildren with goodies. I don't think that I'd ever seen my dad with such a beaming smile. Later that night when the sugar rush had finally worn off and the kids had gone to bed, dad and I were left alone on the balcony. We sipped some of his whiskey and puffed on cigars as we got to talking. I'll skip over the bulk of what we talked about, because that's not really why I'm here. Eventually, we started talking about his newfound retirement from truck driving, and I asked him a question which I had never really asked before. You ever really experienced anything creepy out on the road? Dad was no stranger to talking about his experiences. He had infamous tales of him getting mobbed by crackheads in Atlanta, hitting a cow in Nebraska and the things he saw while driving through Ferguson a few years back during the civil unrest. He was never shy to tell them, but this time, he had paused. He switched the whiskey around his glass for a moment, as if silently debating on whether he wanted to tell me. I guess I might as well tell you now. He downed the remainder of his drink and clasped his hands in front of him. You remember that year that I missed Christmas? By this point, I had almost entirely forgotten about it. But when he said that, a torrent of memories came spiraling back. Yeah, mom was pissed, I replied. And dad gave a hearty chuckle at that and nodded. Oh yeah, she never let me forget it. And that was that crazy blizzard, right, when your truck got stuck? Dad nodded. Yep, dang near flipped my rig that night. Ironically, the snowdrift probably saved my life just as much as it had screwed me over. He then paused and broke eye contact as he contemplated his wording. That wasn't the scary part, though. Dad explained that the area that he went off the road was essentially a barren wasteland. No cities or gas stations around him. Just a winding expanse of road in both directions between dozens of foothills. He again mentioned that he had no cell reception and wasn't sure what to do aside from just wait for somebody to pass by. After a few minutes, it became apparent that that wasn't going to happen. The snow fell in buckets that night and before long, it nearly reached the bottom of his door. Dad's truck at the time was a Cascadia 125, mid-roof sleeper. He had a full sleeping compartment behind the front seat, and provisions to last him a few weeks if necessary. He wasn't too worried about being stranded at least. Well, not at first. After giving up on getting his phone to work, he crawled into the bunk area of the cab and popped a DVD in his portable TV. He figured that he may be stuck out there for at least the night, so he might as well just relax until help arrived. He made sure to insist that if he wanted to, he probably could have figured out a way to get his truck out if he really tried. But he was exhausted and decided to just get some sleep. He said that he drifted off not too long after, only to awake some time later to complete darkness. The temperature had plummeted and he instinctually hugged his arms and felt the goosebumps align in his arms. He had left his truck idling before he fell asleep, but it wasn't running anymore. Confused, he crawled into the front seat to find the keys still in the ignition. He twisted the key and the engine soon rumbled back to life, but something was wrong. He said the noise of the engine morphed into a gurgling, clangling mess of metal and fluid that produced a god-awful cacophony. His dashboard lit up like a Christmas tree, displaying just about every single warning light the system had. A steam began to pour from the hood vents, and the distinct smell of boiling coolant filled the air. After letting it run for maybe 10 seconds, he shut it off in fear of doing permanent damage to it. He knew that something wasn't right with it, and he sighed as he contemplated going out into the cold night to see if he could figure out what it was. He bundled himself up tight and popped the hood. He said the night had this almost ethereal silence to it as he stepped out of the cab. His feet crunched in the snow, echoing like crashing thunder when compared to the pervasive silence. He made his way around the front and he opened it up, releasing a plume of steam from within. After it dissipated a bit, he leaned in and found something which made him quite confused. 
The oil and coolant was splashed all over the underside of the hood, with many other parts of the engine covered in gunk as well. Dad climbed off the grill and glanced underneath the carriage, and that's when he found something truly odd. The oil pan was shredded on the bottom of the engine. He said it looked as though somebody had chopped it with an axe a couple dozen times. The oil had all spilled out into the snow beneath. Clearly, that was why the engine had been running so rough, but explaining how it happened was another matter entirely. He checked around the area and said that it seemed like some of the oil was dripped away from the road and towards the trees. He looked closer and spied what very much seemed like footprints accompanied them. As if the winter night wasn't cold enough, that discovery really tanked his blood temperature. Me quickly headed back towards his cab, but as he reached for the handle, something stopped him dead in his tracks. Something moved behind the end of his trailer, too quick to make out any physical details. It moved on two legs and was clearly no animal. Dad just froze, his fight or flight instincts seeming to stalemate within him. He thought about calling out but said that didn't seem like a good idea. After a few seconds of silence, he made a mad dash to his cab and locked the doors behind him. After grabbing the pistol from underneath the seat, he hopped into the rear with his heart racing. He positioned himself where he was able to glance out at both side mirrors, but saw no sign of whoever was behind the trailer. The radio too was out and after trying in vain to get it to work, he sat back. It didn't make any sense to him. Even if the engine wouldn't fire up, the battery should have had enough reserve charge to power the radio for a little while. He tried calling on his cell phone too and although managed to get it to ring a few times, it would always cut out. Hours passed and not much of anything happened. He dozed off once or twice but tried his best to stay awake and to wait for the sun to rise. The snow had since stopped and not a single other car had driven by since he had stopped. He figured the pass itself was closed. He hoped that someone would have been by. Sometime later, he heard a noise emanate from outside. It started as a slight thump with another soon following, and then another and another. The sounds gradually grew louder and his heart lodged in his throat as it grew nearer. Someone was on his trailer, and he didn't know what to do about it. He clutched his pistol tight, aiming it up towards the roof. And just as he was certain that the person was about to reach the roof of the cab, the sound stopped. He waited there, pistol trembling in his grip for them to emerge, but they never did. Minutes turned to hours and he never heard another sound from the roof. He said after a while that he was no longer even sure whether he had heard anything to begin with. Eventually, his guard slept and the drowsiness took over. He doesn't know if this next part is related, but he's never had anything happen like it, so I figured that I would include it too. He dreamed as he slept there, but it wasn't a normal dream. He said that he remembers walking through a dark forest and viewing it all with incredibly vivid detail. He was completely lucid, and says to this day almost 30 years later that it was the most incredibly realistic dream that he's ever had. Even looking back on it, he says it felt so real that it's hard for him to distinguish it from reality. He seemed genuinely disturbed as he told me about it too. The forest that he was walking through had these massive, looming trees that seemed hundreds of feet tall. Twisted roots surrounded their bases which sprouted from the ground and twisted all over like the tentacles of the kraken. He had to dip and duck around them as he moved, going further but not knowing why. As he made his way through, he started hearing this noise like the ticking of a clock. It got louder as he moved and then sure enough he found the source. A large grandfather clock ticking away in the middle of the bundle of roots. He stopped and stared at it for a moment as it ticked away. The clock's tone reverberated but began to slow. In a few moments, it had began ticking much slower, and the clock itself began to melt. Suddenly, he saw things emerging in the distance from behind the trees. Horrible, twisted creatures like the spawns from below. The sounds of cackling and snarling swirled around him and he began to run. 
He hurtled and leapt through the roots but didn't make it far. Something had struck him hard from behind, knocking him onto his chest. He then awoke with a gasp, panting heavily with a cold sweat permeating his entire body. He scrambled to a seated position while on the brink of panic. His heart was throbbing so fast and hard that it ached. He took a moment to compose himself, and the immense relief that overcame him was one of sheer relief but it didn't last. Something moved at his window and his eyes shut up, and there he saw the face staring back at him. He froze, as stiff as a corpse and cold as a glacier. Time seemed to stand still then, but finally he found the strength to raise his pistol. He fired without really even thinking. A loud bang reverberated in and the muzzle flare momentarily disoriented him. He looked up to see a bullet hole in the window and no sign of the face. After waiting there a few minutes, he ventured to the driver's seat and peered out, but there was nothing there. No sign of that thing ever being there. It didn't make sense to him, as he was certain that he had saw it. What made even less sense was the fact that his phone read that it was only 12.13am. Last time he remembered checking his phone it read at 12.08am. He swears on everything that he had to have been at least an hour before he had dozed off. By this point in his story, I had to question myself on whether he was pulling my leg. My father's a bit of a prankster for sure, but he's never weaved an elaborate story like this before. He then spent some time glancing around out the windows and ensuring that no one else was around. He almost thought that he should just leave his truck and start walking back to town. But obviously, that was an incredibly dangerous notion that probably would have gotten him killed. He stared at his phone for quite a while, watching the minutes slowly tick onward too slowly. He swore that time wasn't working as normal. Several times, he counted aloud to 60, doing his best to approximate a minute. But the minute didn't change accordingly. He eventually just kept counting upwards, finding the minute finally changed when he had reached 386. You would think that after all these worrying discoveries that sleep would have been the last thing that he wanted, but it wasn't enough to prevent. He said that he tried adamantly to resist the urge, but the drowsiness that overtook him was impossible to fight. He found himself walking in the snow, listening as it crunched beneath his feet. A dark and silent forest surrounded him in all directions. It was robotic as if his body acted on its own accord, while his mind drifted in the doldrums. He could barely see where he was going, but it didn't seem to matter. Suddenly it stopped and it seemed to spring back to reality. He glanced around side to side, a sudden terror gripping him. Where was he and why was he outside of his truck? He wondered. He spun back, but he couldn't even see the road behind him. The cold sunk into him and then he saw it. From further in the woods, a familiar face stared back, pale, gaunt, and inhuman. It crawled on all fours, shimmering and shifting side to side. My father turned the complete other way and ran like crazy. Tree branches raked against him as he fled half-blind away from the thing in the woods. Nothing looked familiar, and he just continued running aimlessly through the woods, checking behind him periodically to see if this thing was following him. He never saw it or heard it, but he knew that it was there. Eventually, he smelled the faint scent of smoke lingering in the air. He followed it, hearing a commotion behind him and soon came across a small clearing. In the center of it was a log cabin with a smoke trickling from the chimney. Seeing no other option, he dashed towards it and knocked on the door. And behind him, he could hear odd sounds coming from the woods, and thankfully the door opened a few seconds later. Who are you and what do you want? The voice of an elderly man called from within. Dad turned and saw the barrel of a shotgun aimed at his chest. He slowly raised his hands to convey that he meant no threat. Please, sir, there is... He said as he paused as he thought that certainly this man was going to think that he was some lunatic. But he said it anyways. There's something out there. The man's furious glance reverted to one of intrigue. He then looked past my dad and out into the forest, his eyes suddenly growing wide. 
Suddenly he backed up, still aiming the shotgun at my dad while waving him aside. He pointed him over to a chair in the corner. Dad complied and said as the man locked up behind him. He waited there a couple seconds but apparently heard nothing of concern. What are you doing out there? My dad then told him what had happened with his truck and the blizzard. He told him about the odd occurrences that had happened later on, which culminated him in suddenly waking up walking through the woods. The man sighed and finally lowered his shotgun. He got my dad some water and took a seat across from him. A lot of weird things in these woods. Dad paused as he waited for the man to continue. The man formally introduced himself as Duncan and said his family had owned that plot of land for nearly 100 years. He said that he lost count of how many search parties had come through over the years, as well as thrill seekers, ghost hunters, and generally odd people. I saw a face. Dad finally confessed to him. Duncan eyed him curiously. What kind of face? Dad described it much as he had before, and Duncan just shook his head. Well, that's a new one. He let out a sarcastic chuckle then. You hear all kinds of stories, UFOs, Bigfoot calls, but none of them can ever provide proof. So you don't believe in any of it? My dad asked, only to be countered by Duncan. Of course I do. I've lived out here long enough to know that we humans do not dictate these woods. There are things that lurk in shadows all over the globe, and we may never understand them. But as for what you saw... He paused for a moment, seeming to contemplate as he folded his hands on his lap. There's a group of Native Americans that are rumored to have once lived here. The Apple Carry, ever hear of them? Dad shook his head. And neither had I but a friend of mine who has since passed told me about him. He was an Aperho man himself, and then said that for generations his people had told tales of the Apple Carry. Most other groups feared him said the things they did were evil, more so than the standard tribal warfare one would expect. And people say they held these rituals and experiments, and were rumored that their cruelty was matched only by their intellects. Some people say that they weren't even human, but that's neither here nor there. Duncan trailed off once more, taking a sip of tea from his side table. One of the rumors that many people attribute to the apple carry is that of the wrong ones. A lot of names for them really, not rights, liars, and uncannies. The things that look human but ain't, and some look less human than others. Long faces, wide mouths, huge eyes, a lot of variations. Some say they can affect time and space itself, and others blame them for a lot of weird disappearances. He paused and took another sip and then chuckled. I can't speak to the validity of all that firsthand, but things for certain. There are a lot of weird disappearances, and no one seems to have an answer for them. The air from the room seemed to deflate from his torso, and Dad eyed at a curious man. He had clearly seen a lot over his time, but Dad didn't know how much of his tales to believe. He still doesn't. If all these things are happening, then why do you live out here? Dad finally asked. Duncan reclined in the seat and thought. Dad expected an answer related to his inherited property, but the reality was a bit different. He did in fact mention his ancestral home being a part of it, but he had more to say. If I was 20 years younger, maybe I would leave, but I don't think it would matter. There ain't a place on earth you could run to if they wanted to get ya. Dad said a shiver descended his spine then, and Duncan didn't seem boastful or wild as he spoke, but more as though his realization was a just a foregone conclusion. Thankfully, Duncan allowed my dad to stay the night, and in the morning the two of them made their way back to the road. Luckily, Duncan had a big Dodge Diesel that was able to plow through the snow with relative ease. They soon reached my dad's abandoned rig, finding it in even worse state than he had last seen it the previous night. Multiple tires were slashed, windows were broken, and the engine was absolutely shredded from the bottom. 
And after looking around though, we found nothing had actually been stolen. And Duncan gave him a ride into town and got his truck towed. And a week or so later, he was finally headed home. So, do you believe in that kind of stuff? I finally asked him after he seemed to be done retelling his story. Oh, well, I'd be kind of stupid not to know. He and I both laughed at that, but clearly, he had had more that he had wanted to say. It was a really weird experience for sure, but I've always thought that maybe I misremembered it or subconsciously exaggerated it in my mind. Something about it though was just so haunting. Like I saw something that night that I really wasn't supposed to see and never want to see again. He just sat there for a moment in silence and I figured it best to not ask him any more questions. He eventually told me that between the time of him crashing his truck to when he finally made it into town with Duncan, that three entire days had passed. He still doesn't know how to account for that, and apparently Duncan didn't either. There's a lot of unanswered questions to this that he may never get the answer to now. He kept in touch with Duncan over the years, but unfortunately, he passed away back in 2019. I love my dad and it's disconcerting seeing him that way, you know, confused and terrified. I cannot completely attest to the validity of his story, but I believe him. For many who read this, I'm sure it'll just amount to words on a paper or maybe a fictitious story that entertain you for a few minutes. But to me, it's a horrific possibility at the very least. If anybody has experiences like this or theories, then feel free to share them. Whatever the case. You won't catch me anywhere near I-94 in Billings anytime soon.